Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I think most of you know me, and I know most of you, but for those who don't know me, uh, I teach in a business school, and I teach uh, marketing and entrepreneurship and some leadership courses, so, uh, and I manage all the internships. So one of the things that's helpful with that is I get to see a lot of chaos from students who are trying to figure out what in the world are they going to do uh, with, their, with their life. So um, let's see if we can't take a little, little travel this morning and figure out some of those things, maybe some things you can take away by the, by the end of uh, the period. We should have time for some questions, so I'm going to try to push through. And again, those of you who sat in class with me, you know it's easy for me to get down a rabbit trail. So I'm asking uh, Carly to pull me back, OK? So uh, let's think about some general concepts here. Again, I, I think worldview matters. Maybe it's the most important matter uh, that you can, can address. And a lot of students, a lot of, well, a lot of people, right? What, a, what is a worldview? Uh, I think everybody has one, kind of like uh, belly buttons. If some of you don't have a belly button, you know, I have a son that doesn't have one, but that's a whole different story. Um, but worldview matters. And um, so we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time on worldview matters because it's the way, all right, that we formulate and process everything that comes into us. And we may not have identified what that is in terms of our particular views and our particular filters, but trust me, all information that comes into you goes through your worldview filter, and it's how you process the information, adapt the information, and then ultimately use the information. Um, the second thing we're going to kind of wrestle with today is, is, is there a purpose, or what's the point to anything? What's the point to your life? What's the point to your career? Why in the world would somebody want to start a new business to be an entrepreneur? Um, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, I think the concept of, of entropy is a good one. And here's where I start getting uh, real uncomfortable because I'm not a physicist. But basically, entropy is the idea that things go from order to disorder. And if you want to check me out, you can look it up on, on Google. Um, but so th keep that in mind as, as a concept. So if there's natural bent towards disorder, OK, what might that suggest? that you might be involved in, or could you have some impact or effect on? And then this idea of what we mean by chaos, and we're going to identify some specific elements of chaos that I think have to do with career, and then have to do with, with entrepreneurship. And you might ask, why in the world am I considering career and entrepreneurship? Part of it has to do with, again, my worldview of humanity and people, um, that I think each person all right, has a certain bent towards some kind of creativity. And we'll, we'll see why that is in a minute. At the same time, um, you're also probably entrepreneurial in that are you just satisfied with life as it is, or would you like to see it change? Do you have some sort of vision and so forth for what you would like to accomplish? So here's a basic tension, a worldview tension. There's the materialist side that you might refer to as naturalism. Basically, uh, no point or purpose. Things just are. So we're here because of a series of time times randomness and has created the situation, well not created, has evolved in the situation we see now. A theistic viewpoint, and more specifically a Judeo-Christian viewpoint, is that there is a purpose. There's a reason. And already you can see this, this great divide, right? I mean, if one side and one worldview says there's no point or purpose to anything, uh, if you think about it inferentially and so forth, what, what is that going to lead someone to think about in terms of values, uh, what direction they want to have in their life, and so forth and, and so on? So the primary thing that, that we're concerned about today to get established is, is this idea of a, a worldview and defining it for yourself, and then how can you apply it to your life and the goals for your career and the goals if you're interested in some entrepreneurial venture, whether it's inside a bigger organization, whether it's for you personally, 
uh, or, or professionally. So the theistic worldview, according to Jeske, uh, suggests that God imposes order. All right, God imposes order. Secondly, God declares that order is good. Now, where do we see that? Anybody? You don't have to go too far into the Bible. Genesis, Genesis right? We begin to see that God imposes order, and God declares that order is good. And therefore, it would seem like there's, there's a purpose or an intent. And so purpose is likewise good, right? Uh, it seems as we see the story unfolding in Genesis 1 and 2 that there's a point to it. There's a purpose to it. And then, according to Jeske, he says the opposite of that, chaos, tends towards evil. Now, you just have to think about that for a while. But the more chaos you see, and sometimes we might even argue that current events or whatever, as they get more chaotic, do we begin to see... Uh, some evil things occur or advance, but chaos tends towards evil. So that's just some four, there's, there's a lot more to theism than this, but I think those are some four points that, that will help us as we travel through today. Um, writer of the name of Mobley said, God created a world that works by controlling chaos. Now that might be a little bit uh, different than what you have thought about and I'm not saying this is the only way to look at it, but I was, I was intrigued by what he had to say. He also said chaos is every, ever ready to break free all right, from its restraints. So if order is providing the restraints, you see, and chaos is trying to break away from it, that would suggest there's an agent or agents acting to, to, to restrain, right? And he goes on further to say that human trespass erodes the st stability. Maybe another word for trespass is sin. I mean, think back to Adam and Eve, for example. Um, so that's, again, part of that worldview picture that we're trying to build here, all right? What is our purpose? What is our point? What's going on around us? And then Levinson, who happens to be a Jewish writer and is coming to us from a Hebrew perspective or a Jewish perspective, um, suggests that the confinement of chaos, rather than its elimination, is the essence of creation. Now that's a different thought than we necessarily think uh, as Christians, but I thought it was, it was compelling to look at chaos in, in that way, right? Uh, because it suggests, again, some agency, possibly, that there has to be a process of confinement. And then, you're familiar with this verse. Um, I think this is the King, King James. I should have put that up there. Um, God created mankind. All right, that's all of us in here. In his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That's Genesis 1:27. So God created intentionally, after his own image. Now, again, that's, we could spend weeks just trying to unpack that one verse. I'm just, again, trying to establish for you the sense of a worldview, okay? This is uh, largely how, uh, by the way, I, I kind of come at things, all right? If, if I'm, and ask yourself, if you're created in God's image, what does that imply? That's one of the reasons I wore this tie, not because I don't have newer ties in this. It comes from 1992. Uh, I thought it looked nice on a black shirt. But it also says WWJD on it. What would Jesus do, all right? Very similar, right, construct to this. God made us in his own image, so if we think about how did God make us and why did he make us, and then we fast forward a few thousand years to, okay, <clears throat> what would Jesus do? And we know that popular phrase, and it's, it's become trite to some degree, but still, I think it has bearing. So, back to Mobley, he suggests that there are chaos monsters then that we have to wrestle with. Now remember, I'm just building a framework and we're gonna spend time on career and entrepreneurship here shortly. Um, all right, God has subdued chaos. I, I was challenged to put the word Bailey on there because that's what Moldy says, you know, I, and, and again, it's open to discussion. But the idea is if, it's, if chaos is, is just barely controlled, that it's always constantly behind the scenes trying to, to, to break out, right, into disorder. Um, mankind partners 
with God in the management of chaos. I mean, think about the garden, for example. What was one of the first things that God wanted Adam to do? Anybody remember? Well, wake up. I, name the animals. Right? There's all kinds of animals around there, and, and, and well, I like that animal. Wait, that animal looks different than that animal, and that, how am I going to identify them, all right? So, so maybe some order out of, out of the chaos of all those, all those animals there. And interestingly enough, God has also enacted tough love of moral cause and effect. So if you do stupid things, in other words, immoral things, there's, there's some sort of price to pay for that. And God intends to reward fidelity and to support the management of chaos. I hope that makes sense. But it just says, basically, there are some rules. Because again, the, the, the uh, creation has purpose. And if we go against that purpose, sin, all right, then there's a consequence to pay. Um, and I thought this was also an interesting thought here. Through praise, humans release energy that augments God's management of chaos. Now, you see examples of this, right, in Psalms, and some of you may have experienced examples of that, you know, in your own praise and worship. The other thing is if you read, um, anybody here read Lamentations? Right, we see, we see you know, the, the, the concern and the frustration and, and the disappointment because, God, why have you let me down? The psalmist often talks about that. God, why did you let me down? I see things that have turned into... Into, into a chaotic situation, I don't understand. And this last point is that, you know, frankly, we can, we can begin to understand, again, if we had that worldview that says we have a theistic worldview, we can begin to understand um, the divine design for chaos management and that we are partners in that. Okay. <clears throat> And we should live according to those insights. So, that's supposed to be an ellipsis with a colon. I don't know. I look kind of neat when I did it. I don't. Um, we're created in the likeness of the creator. This is just a summation of this. Energy, input, is required for order. All right? Uh, and if we're agents of God, then, then, then our energy is contributing or can contribute to order. Now, there's, there's a, the way we should be going about it, I believe. Each one of us can contribute to that order. <laughs> and more importantly, because what we're kind of interested in, right, I mean, as individuals, I mean, we, we can have a big picture view, but it boils down to, okay, what are you going to be doing with the rest of your life? You know, how's, how is that going to be played out? And again, can you be entrepreneurial? Boy, there's a lot of letters in that word. Did I spell that right? Um, you know, how's that going to be played out? I believe that each one, each person, because they have a gift, can learn how to use that gift in an entrepreneurial sense. All right. Now, let's move on to career. Let's talk about career. So this is foundation, right? We've got the worldview thing down. We've got the theistic viewpoint down of worldview. We understand that we have a part to play in chaos. So now let's talk about how that might impact career. First of all, and this is the thing I'm focusing on for career today, there is value in failing. Wait a minute. Really? I mean, most of you are scared of getting an F, right, in, in a course. For some of you, it comes naturally. Others have to really work at it. <laughs> I've known students that work really hard to get an F because they don't work at all. That's almost harder than doing it, don't you think? So um, a couple of authors suggested there's some, some benefits of failure. I don't know if you thought about that before, but I, I, I certainly believe that. And, and you'll see, one of the things we tell entrepreneurs all the time, if you haven't failed, you're probably not going to be a good entrepreneur. You learn more through failure than you do through success. So first off, all of our careers, the careers we're going to have, and, and I can look back a lot longer than you can. What Most of you can look back four or five years if you've been working. I can look back. It's, it's foggy how far back I can look. But careers are complex, and they're in a dynamic system, and there's uncertainty, right? 
How many of you know exactly what you're going to be doing a year from now? How many of you know exactly what you're going to be doing tomorrow? Right? Now, some of you are probably thinking, but you know, 20 years from now, I'm going to be X, Y, or Z. Well, that may be so, but maybe not. So, one of the things, the benefits of failure is if we fail, when we fail, and I shouldn't say if, when we fail, and we will, at some form or some fashion or some incident or some situation, some career, I mean, there's nothing worse than having a boss come to you. I had a boss come to me one time and say, you know, Alan, it's just not working. Luckily, he offered me a different job and I was very successful at it. Uh, and they also sent me on the road for 10 years. So, I guess they didn't want me in the office. But, um, but it's an opportunity to learn, okay? What happened here, you say to yourself? What could I have done better? What have I learned from this experience? I think failure also encourages creativity. And again, the reason that, that ties in with entrepreneurship, you'll see in a minute, is because entrepreneurship is in fact a, for the most part, a creative activity. <coughs> see, I fiddle. I wonder where my son fiddles and here I fiddle. I turn things off and I should keep them on. It helps to, to build a strategy because experiential learning is so vitally important and it's through experiential learning that, that you will see that it's important to have a vision for the future. It's just, it gets crazy if you try to have too many detailed steps, I think. But it helps you build a strategy to accomplish something, right? To, to remove the chaos and, and begin to build the order. And then finally, this idea of personal and spiritual development. The greatest times, I want to ask yourselves, some of you have grown spiritually in the last, say, 18, 19 years since you've um, has it come through just all the positive, bright moments, or has it come through some failure that you've experienced in your life? A disappointment, maybe a relationship breakup, uh, maybe you lost a job, maybe you lost a parent, maybe you lost a pet. All those things are, are traumatic, and you can either turn them for something positive or, or for something negative, but, but they are forms of, of failure. So here's a couple of slides on, on application. All right, first of all, you need to accept the fact that failure is just going to happen. And I think we've grown up in a society right, that suggests that failure is the most horrid thing that can happen. And if you've failed, you're always going to be a failure. Well, that's just, that's just wrong. So we just have to accept that that's just part of, of the life that we're going to live. And then, once we've done that, then we can address the fear that we have in failure because failure seems chaotic, does it not? You know, when we fail, oh my gosh, what have I done wrong? I played that, was it Fortnite? Is that where, I played Fortnite when I should have been studying for a Fortnite. Figure that out. Okay. Uh, that's a two-week period, isn't it? Okay. So the studying should have gone into the Fortnite, not the Fortnite into the Fortnite. So what did I learn? But you know, now I've, I've, I've failed, and I've, I'm fearful of that, and it's chaotic. Well, you created your own chaos in that case. Then learning how to do this. We're being told by everybody, I, I can't believe how many times do we hear, you can do anything you want to do. I don't believe that for a minute. Do I believe you can do lots of things, that you have lots of capacity, and you're capable, and that you, you're very gifted? I believe all those things. In the room this size, there's probably only one or two of us could be nuclear physics, physicists, and I'm not one of those. All right? Now, you have to decide on your own if you think you can be one of those, but we can't all be nuclear physicists. And then learning how to tolerate the imperfect. I mean, how many of you get up in the morning, and I don't want to have show of hands, you go to the mirror, and at first you think about, oh my gosh, I can't go out of the room this morning. <laughs> Something ain't right. You know. Piece of hair is sticking out this way. I don't get it to lay down. I won't go into all the other things. Oh my goodness, what did I have for dinner last night? Better take care of that. <laughs> Stuck in my teeth. You're not perfect, all right? So how do you learn how to tolerate? Because society keeps telling you you need to be perfect. You have no limitations. And yet the reality that you're faced with is you have all these chaotic situations. And then valuing the failure for what you can learn from it. A little bit different than normalizing failure, but valuing failure is to really assess it and, and understand what you have learned from it. 
and then setting up a, a process by which, I, I know many of you in here probably keep journals, right? So one of the best things to do is to reflect back on the day or the week and say, okay, what went right, what went wrong? What can I improve? What do I need to discard? Um, what is creating chaos in my life? But I can, I can get rid of it. And then contingency planning. So for example, uh, I've talked to many students uh, who've come to me about their internships. And some just, man, they got their internship down. They know exactly where they're going to go. They know who they're going to talk to. You know, they're on a track. And there's other students who just start freaking out. I don't know anybody. don't have anything. And two things that I've observed to that is, one, there's never been a student that hasn't found an internship, at least in the business school, through the business school. And secondly, Sometimes the providential. I can't believe, I probably at least 10 times in the last three or four years I've had students come to me and say, you know, I can't find something to, to do in my area of interest. And then a week, I get a phone call from some business saying, hey, you know, we're looking for a student that has an interest in thus and so. And I connect them up. Now, you might think that's not providential. I tend to think that it is. It's, it's God taking a chaotic situation and providing a solution, an answer. And then how do we redeem our failure? Okay, 1992. Well, I must have gotten this tie in 93. Uh, maybe it was 91. It doesn't matter. Other than I took on a new career, a new job in a different organization doing the same thing I'd done in a previous organization to a great deal of success. I wasn't making it happen in this new organization. The president came to me and sat down, and I alluded to it earlier, said, Alan, you, you're just not making it happen. So you have a choice. You can either find another job, or I got this job for you. And I said, but I don't want that job. He says, well, this is your choice. And you know, I thought about it, prayed about it, and I said, OK, look, I got two kids at home, got to feed, family, dog, wife, yard, all these things I had to eat, right? Huh? <laughs> In that order, right? No, no, maybe not quite that order. But right, so what do you do? Okay, I'm going to take the job because I got to have a job right now. It's a very chaotic, depressing situation, and it was one of the few times in my career that basically one of my bosses said, "You failed. You know, I brought you in here. I left a, a very lucrative job, came in and, and a year into it. Hey, you're a failure. Okay, what am I going to do with that? I'm going to take up this other offer as a small little piece of the big corporate pie, and." Little did I know, but my intention was to, to make it as big as I could possibly make it. And, and three years later, it represented more than half of the revenue of the company. So it was a totally different arena. But at the moment I faced it, you see, what was I going to do? That's a process of redeeming failure. And another key thing is examining your risk tolerance. Um, about 1994-ish, 5-ish, you know, I decided I did not want to be a CEO. I had job offers to be a CEO, but I said, you know, I just don't have the tolerance for that level of risk. I'm happy, be careful how I say this, I'm happy to be number two, <laughs> the second, right, if that's what I'm asked to be, because I can be a strong supporter to the president or the CEO of the company and help them succeed. I can be a, an advisor and a counselor, but I, I don't, I'm just not up to taking the level of risk. So I understood what my risk tolerance was. Now, later on, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you know, I managed to lose, yeah, I don't know, a couple, three million dollars, something like that. Um, and, you know, I realized that wasn't my risk tolerance either, because most entrepreneurs, they fall over, they get back up, and, and they keep going. I said, you know what? I just, this is, this is the result. So I did get a nice, well, I don't know if it's nice or not, but at least it's, most of it's white now, right? Uh, so you've got to ask yourself those kind of questions. And then, uh, anybody familiar how to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear? Anybody ever hear that phrase? <coughs> how to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. See, that's an old, that's an old Indiana farm talk. But the idea is you take a, a rough, bad situation, and you, and you work on it a bit, and you turn something uh, into something very valuable and pretty with it. And that's what this is about, right? What kind of opportunity, what may look like just rotten apples, you can turn into applesauce and, and eat it in 
before class. Is that right, Paul? <laughs> right. So there's some things about career. Now, in entrepreneurship, we have a little bit different situation. How do we take the essential chaos and use it in development and innovation? And we'll get all this to tie together here in just a moment. Here's some crucial elements. Some of you will recognize this from, from the marketing classes you've had with me. I mean, we talk about the market concept or market orientation, and that says, okay, we need to understand some target audience that, that more or less aligns with what it is we think we can do and figure out what their needs are, right? So the first thing you have to have is, a, is, a, is an orientation toward identifying, uh, describing, and figuring out whether or not you can serve a need. And that's often a very chaotic thing because you're at the edge of, of change. And when you're at the edge of change, that's a very, very chaotic situation. Sears, how many of you used to, well, 20 years ago when you were in your carriage, did your mom or dad take you into Sears? I mean, Sears was like the go-to place. And now it's bankrupt along with Kmart. Why is that? You know, well, we won't go into all that. We could spend days on that, too. But the idea was they began to slip with their understanding of what the need orientation was because the marketplace was beginning to change, was beginning to shift. Um, Best Buy that everybody thought was on the ropes here just about five years ago has managed to survive some of this tension, and they're actually doing pretty well as a, as a retailer. How many of you shop at Best Buy? Okay, well, third to 40 percent of the room. I'm actually about 41.3 percent if I calculated it right. Um, the other thing that is, you, you need to be fanatical about what you're interested in doing. And I think this holds true for career, too. There's two kinds of people that I've, I've been dealing with for years in, in business. And that's people that really are fanatic about what they're doing and how they're contributing to the organization and, and people that it's just a job. You know, and some of you probably heard me say in the classroom, I said, there's students here just here to punch a ticket. For some reason, they can spend tens of thousands of dollars and they're not fanatics about learning because this is a time and place that you'll probably never have again in your lifetime, you see, to learn things. And it's not that I expect you to stand up on your desk and cheer the next topic you know, in the classroom, well, that might be kind of fun. <laughs> but, you know, I can see it. I mean, I can look out at the crowd, and I can, I can pretty quickly grasp who's fanatic, whole, and, and who isn't. Now, the other thing is, is finding experts. One of the, the biggest challenges, because of the chaos of entrepreneurship, or even career, if you think of career as, a, as an entrepreneurial venture, is talk to people who've got some experience. Not that you're going to have the same experience that they have, but they can give you a, and help you a lot come out of some of the, the chaos that you're in, and they can tell you it's going to be okay. This is another thing that's very important, and that is having a long time horizon. I may bring this up again, but one of the things that I'm seeing now is some of you would argue that I'm almost halfway through my career at 67, and uh, I tend to retire at 134. Um, well, at least 82, so mark my words, okay? But as I look back, I, 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 you know, I had, when I was 16, I said, I'll be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. Back then, a million dollars mattered. Um, but you know, what I began to see is, as I began to incorporate more and more of my worldview is that, that my call, as I think is articulated now, was, was to begin to contribute somehow to the kingdom that God had created and to be a Jesus follower meant that, that uh, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. It's just that I wanted to be there when it did happen, and I wanted to contribute to it when it happened. And so the long-term view I have, and I think the Apostle Paul talks about this, right? His long-time horizon was, okay, what to Paul was gain? Anybody remember? Die. To die is gain and what? To live is Christ. That's a long-term view of things, right? So in between now and then, whenever that may be, you know, what am I going to be doing? You know, I'm going to be serving. I don't know if it's going to be a shipwreck. I don't know if it's going to mean I'm going to get whipped. 
I don't know if it's, I'm going to be successful. I have no idea what it's going to be, but I do know this. I know what my, my long-term vision is. So long time horizon. Now specifically, another element is low early costs if you're starting up a business. Most of you don't have unlimited funds. Nobody has unlimited funds. If you've taken uh, Professor Britton's economics class, you know that, right? It's all about constraints because there's no unlimited of anything, at least how we encounter it. And then look for, for multiple approaches. Yeah, you want to be a whatever. You want your company to do a whatever, but you, you, may, you may want to look at alternatives to, to get to that, that solution. And then being able to be flexible and quick. One of the big reasons that Sears, for example, couldn't, couldn't make things happen very well is because they couldn't turn on a dime. Now, they did some interesting strategic things, but uh, like selling off their, their major brands. Uh, hello, you know, like the, the tool business, right? And the Kenmore appliance business. But they can't, they can't turn on a dime. One, one of the interesting things about Amazon, uh, and I'm not saying they're not going to survive forever, nobody does, but is, is they take data and they can process it and respond very quickly. They are a great example of being able to be flexible as, as well as quick uh, in instituting some new things. So uh, again, if you're looking at your career, you're looking at starting a business, having that kind of uh, corporate culture that you're developing is very important. And then how do you incentivize? If you incent the wrong things, you're going to get the wrong things. Now, what do I mean? Anybody, most of you in here have had microeconomics, right? Some of you haven't, but most of you have. So part of economics is about how we incentivize things to get done, right? So if I incentivize you to stay home, when I, and then I ask you to make more sales, what are you going to do? I'm paying you to stay home, but yet I'm asking you to make more sales. I mean, we're going to stay home, aren't we? Because that's how I get paid, and the other one's a little bit more risky. Uh, so I think I'll just be comfortable. That's a real stark contrast. Most incentives work uh, a lot more subtly. But when you're starting up a company or an organization or your own career, what are you doing to incentivize yourselves? You've probably seen some of these tricks, like, well, let's go back to studying. So if you say, I'm just going to play an hour of Fortnite, and then I want to do two hours worth of study, and then I reward myself with another hour of Fortnite, you see those are, you've created your own incentive structure to get your studying done. You see, so same thing holds true in any kind of organizational endeavor. Think about the incentive. What are you incentivizing yourself to do and the organization to do? And then ultimately as you go, the availability of capital, there's only two kinds of capital. There's, there's money, and there's time. So when you're young, what do you have more of? Time. time. Right? So that's, that's a form of capital. Because, you know, once that hour is spent, right, and invested, do you ever get it back? You only get it back in the future. But you can't redeem it from that, from that moment. So invest it wisely. Um, here's some barriers. Um, you will see this, it can happen to you personally, but if you get in an organization, let's say you have a career in a bigger organization. <clears throat> I always <clears throat> was privileged to work in organizations that didn't have a real long list of hierarchical steps. And, and the management, for the most part, was, was deeply involved in the activity of the organization. But if you have management that's isolated, administrators are isolated from what's going on, that's going to be a barrier to reducing chaos to seeing success in career or organization. And that happens in all too many organizations. Intolerance of fanatics. What do I mean? That everybody needs to conform. We want everybody to have gone through the same stamping tool so that you all look alike. As opposed to saying we need to attract people that aren't just going to be yes people and tell me what I want to hear. What's the Bible say about tickling ears? Isn't there something in the Bible about that? You just want people to tell you what you want to hear, make you feel good. So get fanatics in the organization that don't, uh, or if you have people that are counseling that don't just tell you what you want to hear, have them push back. Listen to them. 
Again, short time horizons, it's the opposite of the other. Um, now, I, I knew Dave was going to be in here today, and I almost took this out, Dave, so don't look at this. This isn't about accounting. It's about how you account for things. And what the suggestion was here by, by Quinn is that if you're going to have some, anybody ever hear of a skunk works? Right, if you're going to have a skunk, a skunk works is, is a little side organization that you have in your business. We say, okay, I'm going to, because I have a rather large bureaucratic organization over here, um, say like maybe Amazon and Google are getting to that point, but I want to have some developmental peoples. I want to have some fanatics off to the side, and I'm just going to tell them, you know, take six months and, and come up with all the ideas you can and present it to the senior management team at some point in time. Uh, and you pick three or four, and then you have, have that little group called a Skunk Works uh, continue to work on a project. It's how you expense the rest of your organization. I, so, so let the Skunk Works, according to his suggestion, sort of stand alone. Yeah, they got expenses, and you need to recognize that, but don't try to overburden it with, with overhead. I'll just say it that way for some of your accounts, because what you'll end up doing is cutting out some promising projects because you're, you're applying too much cost to the margin. And Dave and I have discussions about marginal accounting all the time, don't we? <laughs> but but you, again, you have to learn how to manage, manage that. And then excessive rationalism. Um, constantly rationalizing things that just, just shouldn't go, okay? Uh, you think you've got it in order, but it's, it's not. It's, it's chaotic. And so um, you're, you're, you're rationalizing things that shouldn't, shouldn't be going on in your, in your organization. And then again, the opposite of that, we talked about right incentives is, is inappropriate incentives. You, you're incentivizing the wrong thing. Some organizations just set up ways to, to create busy work. And that's, that's a real danger. And it's also a danger to your, to your career. All right, so let's, let's kind of summarize here. We've talked about the importance of, okay, first of all, identifying, articulating all right, your worldview. Then looking at elements in career. How can you take the, the chaos that's bound to happen over a long term in your career and turn it into something positive? And what's the overlap with, with entrepreneurship and some of, the, some of the business principles that we want to take a look at? Now, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. It's a fascinating topic. It's called, anybody heard of emergent order? That what seems to be chaotic from a lot of different branches sometimes comes together and then something more promising comes out of it. Um, GPS is, is one of those examples. When GPS was originally set up, it was really designed just so that we could launch missiles and get them to land where we want them to land. Uh, through global positioning. And then over the years, you know, uh, the U.S. government began to make this technology available. And at first it was just thought, well, it would be help us to map. But you'd be surprised all the things now that depend on GPS. And if GPS ever goes down, you all are going to be hard pressed to light a fire. But, uh, <laughs> so you may freeze to death out there because I don't know where the matches are. I don't know how to get there. Uh, that's the downside. There's, there's chaos that's created out of emergent order when we feel comfortable that there's some kind of order going on, but wait for all that satellite now. Oh, that's something I just heard the other day. GPS has to be maintained on a daily basis. We think it's just to set it and forget it. There are people that are constantly readjusting the technology so that when we want to go from here to Akasushi and don't know how to get there, without looking it up on our phones, all right? <laughs> Imagine if you had to find it. I, I know for my 17-year-old daughter, if I took her phone away from her, I don't think she could get out to the yard. But <laughs> uh, that's not quite that bad. Don't tell her I said that. I, for, I keep forgetting she's going to be here next year. Um, so some sort of inputs, right, are necessary, and a variety of inputs. We don't know what's going to come out of that, but it, it will end in some form of, of order. If you're interested in looking at emergent order, I'll, I'll be happy to give you some, some references. But I think that's something to be considered that, again, it, it points to the fact that we don't necessarily know what, what's going to be ordered from chaos as we begin to put energy and, and input into it. So here's some takeaways. All right. 
vision. You want to stay the course. What's your big vision? Is it in fact, all right, to really be a servant of Christ, or is just becoming personally wealthy? Uh, and, and I'm not, you, you have to decide for yourself, okay? My decision years ago was to be a Christ follower. Whatever that meant, wherever that led me, and there's been disappointments, there's been chaos, but out of that has, has, has come order and assurance that I believe that I'm, I'm definitely doing the, the, the correct thing, the right thing. Another thing, and you go, wait a minute, this seems to be counter to vision, one day at a time, because tomorrow could be very chaotic. Your house might burn down. You might flunk that exam. You didn't catch the fish you wanted to catch when you went fishing. That's, I got a couple of students, that'd be very chaotic. They're, they love to fish. Do you fish? Do you fish? Ben's the big fisherman, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I believe that <clears throat> You have a general idea of where you're trying to go, but you don't know the, the specificity. I practiced that word a lot last night. <laughs> don't ask me to say it again. Uh, the specifics will make themselves apparent as you live one day at a time because you've got the bigger vision. Does that make sense? And that vision's built on your worldview. And that's what I mean by going general to specific. You have to start out with the big stuff. Uh, in terms of vision, and then let these other things, because okay, then you know what to toss away. What's chaos versus what's going to help me gain order? You see, um, I know I, I keep hammering on Fortnite, but if I spend the two hours on Fortnite tonight, yeah, I got another tomorrow night. Um, but if I keep making that same decision every day, pretty soon tomorrow night's run out, right? There's a tension. Now, when I go to church, we, we talk about something called the Via Medea. For those of you who are Latin scholars, it's not a very complicated Latin word. It means the middle way. Um, but it means we're, we're in between two opposite and contrasting things. And, and we have to appreciate that. And if you remember going back to the worldview, you know, we're helping, right? God has asked us to ask us to partner in, in maintaining this order that's right at the edge between chaos, right on the cutting edge. You've, you've heard of Tipping Point. Maybe some of you read about Tipping Point. Was that Gladwell that wrote that? Um, but you know, the Tipping Point is where we're we're placed in history. And then I think it's important that we recognize because we we've, we've been received gifts, we're partners with God, and in effect, we are are God's stewards, are we not? And Jesus talks about that. <clears throat> As stewards, what does that mean? We don't own anything. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm a big proponent of private property. But at the end of the day, I have to recognize that even though I have a legal right to that property, I don't own it, right? Because I'm a servant of God's. And so that property is mine to steward, you know, see, for the, for the, for the kingdom. So, um, and then the last thing is, is service. Let me just suggest, I, I wanted to use, this, this is such a great verse out of the King James Version. Again, don't you love the word beseech? What a great word that is. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you or ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. So that's, that's the, again, that, that brings us back around to that worldview, you know. Uh, a living sacrifice Holy, what does holy mean? Set aside, set apart. Okay, I've made a conscious decision, right, to be a steward and a servant in a chaotic world to help keep it in order, acceptable unto God, which is, King James says, reasonable service. That's not over and above, up and above. It's just what we should, should expect. Um, and then I thought this was, Interesting verse out of Isaiah. Do not fear. Even though we just talked about fear, didn't we? <laughs> we can make use of fear, but ultimately do not fear. God says, I redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Now, 
when I first saw that verse, it was really talking about the nation of Israel, but uh, one of the commentators I read suggested that the I have called you by name is very much a personal call. And, and it's, it's okay to, to pull that out and take a look at it. If God has called us by name, uh, just kind of like those internships, right? Don't know what I'm going to do for an internship, Professor Knight. Um, all of a sudden something shows up because God cares. God's partnering with you. So, look at that. It's quarter till. When I did it last night, it was two and a half hours, so I really sped it up a bit. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go, go way back here. See, there's nobody behind me that's asking any questions or comments. Oh, I need to turn around. Anybody have any questions or comments? Anything that was so confusing that I, even I didn't understand it? I'll tell you what, I have a, oh, yes. Interesting observation, right now they're considering going from quarterly statements to five years, you know, savings every six months, same reason as a short term. Mm. And if people are doing so many things short term, they're not making it go long term, too. You're talking about the corporate uh, reporting or, 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 yeah. Which has been, which has been part of, for those of you who are, some of you are in finance classes and whatnot, and business classes, right, it's been one of the, the condemnations of, of the model that we use for publicly held companies, is what, what Dave's referring to. Uh, it is hard to have a long-term view when basically you're depending on, on the value of your stock in a publicly traded market, and they're evaluating on a quarterly basis. I mean, how do you get up in front of a bunch of people and say, my earnings are down by 30%, but you know what, I'm betting on the future, and two years from now, it's going to be great. And most shareholders have a hard time. Though, the counter to that would be Amazon. Somehow, Amazon shareholders have this, this uh, sort of attitude that it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen one of these days, and maybe it will. But, but Amazon has not been extremely profitable with their, their retail sales, you know, the, the, their website. They make their money off Amazon Web Services. So good point. If I offer to give somebody, I have a copy, you haven't heard this, but I have a copy of In Search of the Holy Grail. We found out we have a second, we had two copies. <laughs> I mean, I will, I will give that to the winning question today, but I, Dave can't participate because he's part of the organization. Well, even that doesn't work. Gosh. Okay. So no more questions. I'll be standing around here. I hope this was helpful to you today. Thank you. You've been a very attentive audience, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you.